Very good. Okay, right, we're seven seconds. Five. Okay, Ron, go ahead, take it away. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, welcome, everybody. You have tuned into PMC 2022, Focus on Africa. This is going to be a really wonderful, informative panel. Thank you all for joining us here today. Uh, before we get started, let me just mention uh, there will be a brief Q&A session towards the end of the panel. So please put any questions you may have in the chat or Q&A section next to your screen. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce our panelists today. We have uh, Joe Tom Matatiro, who is the CEO of CAPASO, the South African Mechanical Society. Um, we have Karabu Sena, who is the general manager at SAMRO, the South African Performing Rights Society. And we have Simon Sibanda, who is the founder and CEO of Slam Production Music, a production music library based in South Africa. Welcome, gentlemen, and thank you very much for being here today. Um, so uh, let's uh, start, kick it right off, um, just with a general question um, for Simon and the panelists. What, what is the current state of production music in South Africa and Africa in general these days? Hi, Aaron. Yeah, so basically it's, it's growing steadily. Um, I'll, I'll start off with some, I mean, there's uh, a lot of uh, new channels that are popping up and our main cable network TV station, uh, it's looking to expand into the territory. So you find that, uh, there will be, uh, new TV channels that are coming from different African countries and different territories. So, uh, that means, uh, they're creating more content and then there will be a new so um, uh, production music is advantage is mostly in uh, stuff that are made, you know, with a lot of episodes like uh, TV dramas, reality shows, things that are being produced and uh, are rapidly uh, broadcasting daily. So uh, it's an advantage uh, because, you know, if you have to get a composer, then the, the turnaround is not going to be able to service the demand. So production library comes in there and it helps a lot. So um, for me, I think the prospects are very positive. We have, even in South Africa itself, we just have new channels coming up digitally, the channels on TV uh, stations, uh, TV stations that are being formed in different territory within the sub-Saharan territory also. These are uh, uh, new stations that, uh, that that we're experiencing and new shows like they're creating shows that are based on um, indigenous languages. So you would have maybe uh, the same show being reproduced uh, three, four times because of different languages and stuff. So uh, the outlook is positive. The challenge is, is mostly in advertising. We, we find that advertisers are very, very selfish. So they will sometimes download a library track and not use the track and just like re-record it and, you know, manipulate the melody. We have that challenge. And uh, we're still licensing advertising, but I don't think it's at its fullest potential. Sometimes they, they work with composer. Sometimes they have studios within the advertising agency to, re to, to produce uh, music. So, um, yeah, so, but uh, in general, the the state of production music library is positive so are you saying some so, advertisers they do a re-recordings re of existing music without a license uh, from the publisher are you saying yeah yeah they'll, they'll manipulate the melody you can tell this is your song but uh, the melody has changed so much that uh you can tell okay this if they were going to use a library track they're going to use my song it sounds like it but the melody is different Oh, so, so you can't technical like... where you can really claim it. Yeah. Understood. Understood. So, Very Ron, good. In, uh, Jotam, yeah. In addition to um, what Simon is talking about about the broadcasters and all that, there's also be uh, there's also the three big uh, video on demand streaming services are coming onto the continent. In fact, they are already here, and um, in 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 a 
in the discussions that we had um, about two months ago at the Deben Film Festival, they were actually unveiling their plans for the continent and how they are looking to create a lot of local content. And um, that shows that there will be a huge demand of production music for them to be able to produce all that content. So apart from broadcast, uh, on the streaming platforms as well, we are seeing actually a lot of demand for production music, which is coming through. Very and, good. Go uh, ahead, Sarapo. So, sorry, Ron. So I think from a ceremonial side, obviously from a performing rights society perspective, what we do see is that uh, production music is also increasing in terms of revenue, uh, you know, when you compare it to uh, commercial music, purely because of the frequent use that exists in the market, as, you know, uh, Simon has already uh, explained. And uh, you will find that, you know, uh, production houses are even looking for new content, you know, all the time. Uh, and that's one thing that's good within our market. So they don't stick to typically one sort of like library for the most part, you know, they will, they will shop around in a sense so that they get the most value. And that is why we see a lot more entrance in terms of the Samro membership where, you know, different works are used all the time. Uh, it's not the same typical thing, uh, but, you know, obviously the money is always in the, you know, sitcoms or, you know, anything that's repetitive or the news jingles and those sort of things, that's where the biggest, you know, sort of revenue is collected. But when you look at, you know, some of the things that Jotim has touched on, where you have streaming services and new content being created all the time, because that is the South African market where people are moving a bit away from US content or UK content. You know, they want something much more sort of like organic and then that requires a lot more library music to create those new, you know, sort of TV shows or even radio shows. That's very interesting. And that leads nicely into my next question, which is uh, what styles of music are popular in South Africa for creating all this local programming? Uh, perhaps, Simon, uh, you can give us some idea. What, what styles of music are trending now in production music in South Africa? You're on mute, Simon. You're you're on mute. Okay. First off, I'll start with the, the most uh, uh, most popular uh, styles of TV. Uh, South Africa and Africa in general at the moment is very obsessed with uh, reality TV. So the likes of Housewives are being produced and reproduced in different languages. So you find things like uh, dramedy. You know, uh, drama, suspense, uh, they, they, they get to a lot of spins. And then these are also TV dramas and soapies. Uh, that kind of style of music. And uh, because South Africa is like, uh, internationally inclined, the, the music is not too specific. You won't say, um, no, we, we need a just an African sounding track. It's, a, it's, it's different genres all the time for different purposes. And uh, some vernacular dramas uh, that depict uh, the local culture would then need specific African music. But in general, the most prominent uh, uh, um, uh, TV productions are very urban, you know, they're very uh, uh, current, they try to keep up with the trends. So they, they tend to use all kinds of genres that are, are, are appealing to, to the urban culture, you know, pop, mm -hmm. hip hop, R and B, et cetera, rock, pop, you know what I mean? So that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Uh, in Africa now, Africa is becoming very uh, and very it's, 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 it's in touch with current trends. So and hence, you'll see shows like Housewives trending over there because they, they most of the time we emulate those kind of shows, and then sometimes we then convert them into like uh, to adapt them to our culture. Yeah, but uh, all kinds of genres have uh, work. The only music that I think I, I might discourage is like uh, very specific music, like let's say uh, your European accordion music like you know like traditional music that are, uh, that is specific for territories mm -hmm. uh, but your generic styles and urban music 
because people who are consu consuming this content is mostly people who live in urban areas and uh, are looking to 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 be part of the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Joe, Tom, and Carabo. Do you uh, are you seeing any other trends in uh, music being uh, licensed with a Capasa or Samro for production music? Uh, you're you're on mute, uh, Joe Tom. Okay, so uh, Simon has covered almost all of it. Uh, basically, that's what we rely on uh, on what they would have licensed, uh, what they would have um, used and offered to 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 the production houses. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so, so Ron, I'm in agreement. I think mostly the urban style, um, you know, is very uh, urban and pop. That that's normally what we see, even if you look at adverts um, it, it's, it's a lot of like happy type music right so you know that create that sort of feel it, it's that's the music that you see quite often even for radio and so forth that's the type of music that you know I think is utilized from libraries uh, or even commissioned mm -hmm. very good okay let's get into uh, the nuts and bolts of licensing and uh, Joe, Tom, uh, you're the CEO of uh, Capasso, the Mechanical Licensing Society. So can you, get, uh, can you give us uh, a summary? Uh, how is production music uh, licensed in South Africa? What is the process? Okay, so there are two processes, Ron. So firstly, we do license on a transactional basis. Uh, this is where if there's an advert or there's a once-off production, then um, uh, the, the production house will approach us and then we avail the library of music for all our members who are members of um, the Production Music Association of South Africa. Then they can be able to select from that list what type of music they would like to do. And then uh, when we invoice them, the invoice acts as a license because they pay for it in advance. And for that, we actually pay every quarter because we would have already received the money. Uh, on the other hand, we also license broadcasters on a blanket license basis. So with all the broadcasters, we give them a blanket license, which, which covers both production music and uh, commercial music. However, because with production music, we cover both um, the recording and the musical work because... Uh, the production music libraries give us that mandate which covers both. Uh, that will also determine the value of the music to the broadcaster in terms of the differentiation between commercial and production music on the um, blanket license. And that determines our distribution rules as to how we can then be able to apply it. And uh, the good thing is, I think, which is the first, what we have also done is Apart from licensing, there is one broadcaster who is a multi-territorial broadcaster. Uh, we have also licensed them for on a blanket basis for productions that they are doing across four countries on the continent. So what it means is that they get that one license from us, which is a mechanical license, and then they can choose the music from our members and use across all those four countries um, based on that blanket license. And then in terms of uh, transactional licensing as well, because of the fact that through our blanket license, we have managed to be able to be in touch with production, uh, uh, production houses in those other countries. So when they want to do any productions that require transactional license, they also come through to us and we can also give them a license uh, for those countries. But obviously we do it in conjunction with the local CMOs uh, so that we don't seem to be encroaching onto that. The benefit that they have is that their members are now also benefiting from the blanket license that we put in place here in South Africa, which covers those countries because the cable TV network is based in South Africa. So it was easier to get into an agreement with them from here and then they can be able to reproduce in all those countries. But the benefit that it also gave to our direct members is that as opposed to us relying on the other CMOs to be able to collect and then rely on bilaterals to receive that money, we are able now to get the reports for all the countries and then we can process and pay our members directly. And uh, we were also able to provide that convenience, just like a convenience which we give to all the DSPs, 
we managed to give that same convenience. In fact, we transferred the DSP multi-territorial licensing concept from the streaming services to the broadcaster. And that has actually benefited quite a lot and we managed to increase even the value of the license by so doing. Uh, that's very, that's very interesting. Uh, thank you, Joe Tom. And regarding the uh, the blanket licenses with broadcasters, uh, can you can you give us uh, an idea? Is that divided up uh, between your members and broadcasters report everything they're using? Sorry, if you're going to repeat the question, Ron. So regarding the uh, the blanket licenses that you have with the broadcasters. So how do you divide up those blanket fees uh, among your among your uh, publisher members or production music uh, library members? OK, so uh, what we do is we get uh, the broadcast reports uh, from the broadcasters and then we also receive the cue sheets uh, from the broadcasters. And then we uh, put that into a system and then we process it. So we then manage to find um, the number of minutes uh, per each track that has been used. And then we have got a rate that we apply, which is a 30 second rule uh, in terms of how many, how long, what is the duration on each and every song. And then the song is allocated based on per play, how many times it was played, uh, what is the duration, and then we allocate that money. And then, like I mentioned, so what we do is for production music, it, it ends two units and then commercial will be having one unit because the two units for production is covering for both the recording as well as the music, uh, the musical work. And then that is how we allocate. So we actually allocate per actual play depending on the tracking that we would have done. And then we identify the duration and then we allocate it in that way. And then we pay and distribute to our members. So each member will be able to receive a statement which actually shows in which programs were their songs used such that should there be anything that is missing, the members are able to come to us to say, but I had my song which was in Housewives of Deben, but I have not been paid. We should be able to go back and relook at that so that we can be able to correct. If it has been paid, we will be able to identify where exactly it was paid. And um, these payments are being done on a, on a biannual basis, which is after every six months. Interesting. And you, you mentioned something about a 30-second rule. Does that mean that uh, productions less than 30 seconds are not accounted for? What does that rule apply to? So the rule applies such that between uh, one second and 30 seconds, it's considered as one unit. And then from 31 seconds to 60 seconds, that's two units. And 61 seconds plus, it becomes three units in that way. Oh, thank you. So um, let's get into uh, talking about how Capasso works with Samro. And uh, can you gentlemen give us an idea who receives the, the cue sheets and what kind of coordination is happening between uh, Capasso, the Mechanical Society, and Samro, the Performing Rights Society? So the broadcaster reports to both of us because we have got separate licenses. So each society receives uh, the cue sheets uh, from the broadcaster. However, what we then do is we then share, after processing our cue sheets, we then share with Samro uh, and then and vice versa so that we can be able to check uh, if there are any cue sheets that we would have missed and then we can be able to cover that gap. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, so, um, Karabo, can you give us an idea of the uh, how... Uh, how Samro is working and, and how you are coordinating with uh, other collection societies on the continent. Uh, thanks, Ron. So from a Samro side, I think maybe let me uh, just explain how, you know, some of the elements that Jotun touched on uh, from, uh, you know, uh, MR side. So Samro, we do also provide, you know, blanket licenses to uh, broadcasters. Those are the biggest, uh, you know, licensees. And then we also obviously license general uh, sort of like uh, service providers like, you know, cinemas and the likes, where you, you then get usage from those, but including, you know, restaurants and department stores and those, uh, those type of businesses. Now, what's important is that obviously where we can get usage, we use that specific usage to pay out for the music used 
And the big thing is the frequency. How often is that music used? Because from a performing rights perspective, you know, the, the number of times that music is used does actually factor in, in how we pay. So simplistically, uh, what we do, it's a simple formula where we look at, uh, for example, if it's a radio station or a TV station, uh, we will then, let's say, license it for a million rands. Once you license it for a million rands, we then take the total amount of music, like in seconds, used in that, let's say, TV station. So this would be all the music from, be it background music, music in a TV show, and so forth. And then we just divide it with that million rand. So for example, let's say the total seconds used over a year is a million seconds, right? That would mean that the unit rate, what we call a unit rate, you divide the one million rands divided by the total you know, usage, which is a million seconds, and that will make it one rand, for example. So that's how we get to the unit rate. And obviously, if your music is, is used often, let's say you have, uh, for example, 500 seconds of music, we'll just multiply that 500 seconds of music to one rand, that makes it then five, you know, 500 rands. So that's the logic. So the more your music is used, then you would tend to, to earn more. So uh, one of the big factors that, you know, I think I need to also share is where we don't get the usage per se, we then use what we call a proxy station, you know, so it could be either a proxy TV station or a proxy radio station, because, you know, there are instances where you can't get, you know, usage. Therefore, you try and use those just so that the distribution is equ equitable enough. And then we try and identify it with a like, you know, sort of like a user of that music from a radio or TV standpoint. So, so from a similar perspective, that's, that's, you know, how we would calculate it. But then on the aspect of how we work with other societies, especially within the African territory. So the essence is making sure firstly that we have bilaterals. And uh, there are challenges still, you know, from an African territory perspective, because um, you know, as much as we may have those bilaterals, it is not always sort of, um, uh, let's say, understood or taken for granted that payment would be made the other way around. So, so we, we are currently engaging quite strongly with, you know, various African societies, making sure that, you know, we are obviously paying through any usage that is part of our repertoire that is taking place in South Africa. We are paying it over to them. But then also at the same time, making sure that any usage that is part of the SAMRO repertoire is paid you know, uh, through to SAMRO. But from an international repertoire perspective, let's say with ASCAP, BMI, PRS, you know, um, that type of repertoire, we definitely then, SAMRO uh, pays it through directly from this side for, for any usage within the South African Lesotho and Swaziland territory. So SEMRO collects for those three, you know, geographical territories within Africa. And then for those, we pay directly to the respective societies. Uh, but for the other societies within Africa, uh, they, they would need then to pay directly to, let's say, an ASCAP or a BMI or a PRS or a GAMMA. They would need to pay directly to them. So, but the challenge within the, the great African continent is always to make sure that, you know, parties understand that, you know, they can't delay payments where you have maybe three, four years where, you know, societies have not been paid. That's often the challenges, but we are still working together with even the likes of Capasso, trying to do outreach and make sure that, you know, um, the other societies understand the, the critical aspect of paying out the money that's due to other societies. Very interesting. And uh, so you... Yes. Yeah. So uh, with Capasso, I think our relationship has, uh, you know, Capasso is just eight years old. And uh, I think having become the leader in digital licensing, that actually created a very good relationship for us with uh, the other societies across the continent, such that, uh, the, and this is why we were able to then set up that uh, mechanical license um, for that uh, multi-territorial license. And... Um, with uh, we are currently also they have also given us a mandate on production music or on 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 uh, VOD services, such that we are currently negotiating a multi multi territorial licenses that cover the rest of the continent as well, which actually in my view benefits our members quite a lot and those that would decide to join Capasso directly would be able to benefit in that. 
um, as Karabo is talking about all the challenges that are there, the issue is that we are able to collect that money directly. And um, in terms of the broadcasters, it's just not possible to be able to uh, license, particularly a broadcaster that is based in Nigeria, for example, or Kenya or Zimbabwe. It's, it's just not possible for a company that, a CMO that is based here to be able to license. But that is different with um, video on demand services and uh, uh, streaming services. And Capasso then is the hub uh, for all digital licensing across the continent, which makes our relationship with these societies very good in that because we license all that is being streamed in their countries, there has been a lot of flow of money to them and to their members from ourselves. And that has created a very good relationship such that, as Karabo is mentioning, when we talk to them about what needs, what is and has to be done, there's been a very good... And we have also seen a lot of collaboration from them, uh, us learning as well, other things that we wouldn't have known from those societies as well. Well, that's really terrific that Capasso is now operating as a hub for mecha mechanical digital licensing for multi-territories on the continent. That's uh, it's really terrific. So, so uh, Ron, uh, maybe yeah. just to correct that, in, in a, we are a mechanical license uh, society in South Africa, but when it comes to multi-territorial licensing on the African continent, we collect both performance and mechanical for those societies, and then we pass it on to them to distribute. So if you're collecting performance, so how does how does that impact uh, Samro if you're also collecting performance for the, from those other territories? So, so, so there's, uh, a joint, there's a joint relationship, Ron, uh, that obviously from uh, Samro and Capasso, uh, you know, we have that manages that sort of relationship just to make sure that, you know, there is understanding between all parties. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, okay, I want to uh, ask a question, a related question to Simon now, uh, since you operate a library in South Africa. So, you know, my understanding is that there is a rate card uh, that uh, Capasso provides for production music, similar to MCPS in the UK. Um, so, Simon, uh, could you let us know from your perspective, uh, in what situations do you follow the Capasso rate card and what situations do you negotiate the rates directly with clients? All right. Um, so basically, uh, as a member of PMSA, um, we, 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 we like to discourage uh, direct licensing because um, we feel like it reduces the value of music. Uh, it creates a lot of undercutting which uh, it's detrimental to the actual value of music. So um, to make sure everybody, all the players are taken care of, we, we actually use a central place for licensing purposes. We go to Capasso for mechanical licensing. And uh, so basically the guys at Capasso have a division where uh, people can invoice and code people uh, via the same rate card. So if I'm dealing with a client, I'll actually uh, introduce them to the rate card, explain to them how it works, show them how the figures work, and then refer them to Capasso for licensing. So Capasso will then be able to collect the information and, uh, and, and, and invoice the client. So um, we, we basically encourage that because um, if every, every individual is going out there licensing for themselves, people obviously drop their prices to try and be favorable to the clients and it will be to the detrimental of the composers. So, um, yeah, so we, we do use the rate card, but most of the time when it comes to the actual exchange of, of funds, we, 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 we let uh, uh, Capasso take over. Yeah. Are there any situations or any particular licenses uh, where you do not uh, follow the Capasso rate card? No, very rare. I mean, there's uh, these small uh, licenses that happens where it's like a, a, um, a YouTube uh, or a wedding video, but mostly YouTube would be non-profit organizations that are approach you and say, yeah, this is the situation. What kind of trade exchange can we do? 
and then we inform our composers if they're interested in such a thing and then be able to license at a very low rate or maybe find something to trade exchange the music uh, with a client for but uh most of our licenses they definitely go through uh, Capasso because it's it's a bit more regulated there. Right, right, right. Yeah. Understood. And uh, you mentioned um, an organization called PMSA. Would you uh, explain to us what is that and what is the uh, purpose of that organization? Okay, basically, it's an it's an association uh, for production music uh, library co uh, uh, companies. Uh, we basically decided to get together. So we're able to uh, liaise and, you know, uh, exchange ideas and lobby uh, the societies, influence uh, 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 policy around music and arts and culture. Uh, so we, we get together and then we 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 able to discuss the, the nitty gritties of the industry and figure out how to keep it basically uh, workable. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of threats like uh, uh, royalty-free libraries. Uh, there's, uh, there's libraries that, that, that are by us that try to come into the, the territory. So we, when we get together, we discuss such issues and how you know, we can basically try and have solutions for such things. Right. So I think the, the PMSA yeah. also helps try and regulate uh, the production music libraries. And like Simon was mentioning, in terms of what are the do's and the don'ts and what are the benefits and the shortcomings of certain behaviors that will result in the devaluing of uh, the music that uh, they are selling. Because others might be short-sighted if they don't have that guidance. They also use that same um, association to be able to assist and groom uh, smaller libraries uh, to be able to then also participate in the market. Mm -hmm. Very good. And um, as Simon mentioned, uh, you know these uh, these uh, royalty-free libraries and buyouts. So, what what are some of the strategies you're using in South Ar Africa to push back against these these types of uh, companies? Yeah. So basically, we, every library company gets feedback from their sales uh, reps and their marketing people, who basically interact with the clients to basically uh, find out what are the issues, uh, why why would they prefer royalty free, which is usually low quality compared to uh, the prominent libraries on PMSA, because we got majors there and independents that are really prominent in the in the in the territory, so um, so they go out there and then they find out what 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 would work for their clients, what we would be more convenient, and then we try and you know like try to find a balancing uh, a, a situation where the the clients are not discouraged from using uh, the, the the libraries that are are, are not buyouts the royalty-free music libraries versus the libraries that are actually representing real composers who are trying to uh, basically make money through their music. So, uh, yeah, whenever we meet, we discuss such things and see how we can make it more convenient for our clients. Um, it's usually clients that are, are not in the bucket license. For instance, if you have a producer that's producing for a TV station that has already, you know, has a blanket license with the societies, that's kind of easier. But uh, all the independent producers, like advertising guys, documentaries, guys who are doing movies uh, for, for the main circuit, who are doing movies for, for the likes of Netflix and all those platforms. So um, we, we always try to, you know, meet them halfway and make sure they, they've been convenient. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned... Um advertising so i'm i'm just curious um on this in terms of samro does samro pay on performances of advertisements commercials and promos uh yes we do so essentially um the easiest way of thinking about it is that any music flighted on tv um or also on radio uh, this would include you know uh, even background music so from a production or commercial side um, that music would be considered as part of a performance uh, and 
would receive then, you know, sort of what we, the, fig, the calculation that I gave you in terms of a unit rate so that we can pay it out. So, so from our perspective, we are literally administering for all music and uh, our composers and publishers, you know, uh, know that they need to notify us of all the music that is, you know, uh, broadcast so that we can ensure that they are paid for it. Um, and, and that's, that's, I think, the encouragement that, you know, gets uh, people to ensure that when they are selling their music, they are focusing on these high rotation platforms because then it allows them to earn a lot more. Uh, if the production music is used in those platforms. So it sounds like the uh, the burden uh, is really on the members, the publishers and composers to inform you when their music is used in commercials and advertisements. Certainly. So th there is a, I think it's, it's, there's, it's too prompt. Um, the, the usage, there are elements where we get enough information from the usage but it is not a foolproof scenario because you will still need to know, uh, receive a notification to know who should we pay. Uh, not just knowing that the music belongs to, let's say, Slam Production, we know that, yes, that is Simon, but, you know, there is probably an underlying composer that, you know, Simon would be representing, so we don't know who that composer is. So we would need to receive that information because Semro pays directly to the composer and as well as the publisher. So we are paying directly to all those parties. So we need that information. If we don't have it, uh, you know, there's a process that we go through where, uh, you know, we don't distribute it in the what we call the primary distribution. So those members can then participate in the secondary distribution where then we wait for that information. We make the information available to the publishers and the composers and they can identify their works. Once they're done identifying their works, they submit that notification so we can release it in the secondary uh, distribution. So we have a three-year period where you can actually participate in secondary distributions so that you can collect those works. And it's, it's, it's really not a simple process, but it's one that works once one understands how to interact with it. Right. Um, and... Um... Joe, Tom, what is the process for uh, uh, issuing a mechanical license for commercials and advertising with Capasso? So with Capasso, what happens is that um, if any production house has been um, commissioned to do any production, they come to Capasso and uh, they tell us, uh, we give them, we avail to them all the libraries that, uh, and most of them are members of the PMSA, and uh, they can access it through our website. They go onto our website, they click the libraries, they can listen to the music that they would like to use when they have um, selected, because they'll be listening to snippets of that music. When they've selected what they would like to use, they then come to us and say, okay, this is the song that we would like to use and all that. Then we raise an invoice and on that invoice, we actually identify the specific song that they would like to use so that uh, when they eventually use that song, we already know which song it is, and we can already we are already in the process of preparing for the distribution, such that um, when they then give us the cue sheet, we already have that song even on our invoice, and we then alert the production um, music library and say, these people would like to use your song, so that they can allow them access to download that song, and then they can use it wherever they would like to use. So our invoice, acts as a license for them to be able to get that music and then use it uh, mm -hmm. because they would have already paid in advance. So for all advertising, uh, they have got to pay upfront. Mm -hmm. Very good. Let me uh, ask you, gentlemen, um, are you making use of, of any kind of uh, technology at your societies, uh, Samro, Capasso, uh, such as a BMAT or TuneSat or anything else to uh, monitor and track performances? And licenses? Uh, from a Samro side, yes, we are currently using, uh, you know, uh, music recognition technology uh, from uh, MediaHost. So it's it's a South African company uh, that, you know, is essentially monitoring radio and TV, um, you know, uh, and, and reporting on, obviously, the identification of music. So it's similar to BMAT in essence. Um, so the only difference is that this is a South African version of it. And um, what we would receive then would be um, obviously a comparison of the ingested uh, works and 
in, in, in correlation to the, you know, what was used, obviously, on that particular station. Currently, we are not just solely using that information. We are still comparing the broadcast information because we essentially started this project run about a year ago. So we are still using the broadcast information and comparing it to the music recognition technology. So we haven't flipped over totally. But, you know, one, I mean, what we have noticed is that even with the, you know, MRT tech technology, it's not as simplistic because we interact with a lot of societies like PRS and Gamma. And you'll find that even they still use, you know, both formats. Uh, so, you know, they don't just stop using the one, like the usage from the broadcaster. So broadcasters still give you a lot more information to some degree. Uh, because we still have a challenge where a lot of our members have not necessarily submitted their music to these, uh, you know, to media hosts. So therefore, it creates a challenge of identifying that music. And, you know, that's where the broadcaster usage logs then help us in terms of, you know, completing that. And as, you know, Jotem has already said, we also work in correlation with Capasso so that we get certain cue sheets as well where, you know, we might not have have them and just to make sure that we can increase our documentation and pay out as you know as accurately as we can, you know, to all the the music uh, users. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. So you de you develop this technology. This is a uh, a local technology that you developed instead of going with one of the existing uh, identification services. So interesting enough, um, we had a pilot uh, process run about just probably a year and six months back. No, 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 this is much longer prior to COVID. So we had, uh, you know, a pilot where we had, um, you know, uh, BMAT uh, and we had media host uh, as part of the pilot. And what came out strong is that the local provider at that point was a lot more stronger in terms of local needs, uh, that is. And uh, that's why I think they were much more competitive. Uh, so that's why we went with that particular provider. Um, you know, not, not to say that, you know, from a BMAP perspective, there was no value because we, we actually used that particular product for about six months. And, and we could see the value, but, you know, there was a lot more, more attractiveness to the local provider, hence why we signed with them. So I think the biggest, the biggest challenge that we do have is that um, most of uh, the local tracks are not... Um, available on the tracking system. We also use media host, by the way, but we realize that while the tracking uh, provides more or less more efficiency in as far as commercial music is concerned, uh, the tracking of production music is very bad. Um, you find that uh, in some cases, they don't even identify the music because they need a certain number of times for the fingerprinting to then identify the song and in some cases the song is not even there and then when you get the reports uh, because most production music um, tracks here in South Africa do not have ISRC codes and all that so there is no unique identifier to be able to identify that song so you may get the data but you may not be able to use it because unless you know the name of the composer then you won't be able to use it. But, you know, we have got very a lot of similar names. And where we have got a lot of similar names, you need that unique identifier to be able to identify it. And we end up actually going back to the manual system where you now have to use um, the production and then probably the episode number and all that for you to be able to identify that song because of the manner in which production music. Uh, so basically the tracking companies uh, seem not to have really found the best way to be able to identify particularly production music. Interesting, Accurate. very interesting. Yeah. Well, um, let's turn to Simon now and, and talk about, um, you know, d dig a little deeper into some of the uh, challenges that are, are facing uh, someone such as yourself running a production music library in South Africa. What do you see, what do you see as the biggest challenges to doing business? You're on mute. All right, cool. 
Yeah, so yeah, the the, ch- the challenges when it comes to production music library will be mostly uh, individual production houses that don't basically take uh, a music cue sheet serious. Uh, there's been a couple of uh, smaller companies that create software to try and help final mixers and editors to be able to generate cue sheets easy. But in the most part, you'll find that uh, uh, a lot of uh, independent producers don't take uh, information seriously. They don't uh, basically, information transfer is not being prioritized. For instance, I'll make an example. If somebody's producing a movie and you get your composer to compose the movie, uh, then the producer once they have sold the movie and the movie is going to be shown on or at the cinema, they, they often jump the process of uh, creating a music cue sheet. So mm-hmm. uh, I've had, we've had that challenge over time for movies that are, are going into our movie, uh, uh, our movie houses in, in South Africa. You find that when the distribution comes, the movie doesn't appear. And I realized like our, our main movie distributors in, in South Africa as well, even for international movies, would uh, skip the process of actually making the cue sheets and making them available to the society. So that's one challenge that we have be, besides uh, advertising being fickle. That's one challenge we have. And uh, so some of us publishers, we've taken the initiative of actually going out into production houses and educating them about cue sheets and how to share data with the society so that uh, the situation is better for our composers. And sometimes we literally have to walk in and grab the cue sheets and submit them ourselves into uh, 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 the societies. So that is the main challenge with, uh, with when, it, when it comes to production music. With music in general, you find that there is even a radio station. I think they, there was a radio station that was sued because it hadn't reported uh, for a couple of years. It hadn't, it hadn't reported its, its playlist. So there are people who who take music as an after afterthought, especially when it comes to uh, people, music users, or who are, who are producing independent stuff. With the broadcasters, it's good because sometimes they they have policies and they. They actually force uh, the, the people who are submitting uh, content to actually have information for the music. So you'll find that they don't even reject the tape uh, or whatever uh, uh, format they are, they are, they are, they are, they are actually um, submitting in. They will reject it if it doesn't have the complete information, which is a good thing. But with the independent producers, it becomes a challenge. Then we have to literally, most of the time we have to babysit them, walk in there, sometimes send somebody to sit down and help them do a cue sheet and help them find the missing information. That's the main challenge. Understood. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, information. Um, well, we're getting towards the end of the panel. So I see we do have a few questions that came in the chat. So I'm going to go through a few of these. And um, gentlemen, feel a fee f- a free to respond as appropriate. Um, okay, here's a question from Murette. Um, what is the geographical reach? It's my understanding that South Africa is an entertainment hub for many countries on the south and eastern part of the continent. Nigeria is another entertainment hub. Is there any crossover? So I think we touched on some of this earlier, but a uh, gentleman, would you care to elaborate uh, to the extent that South Africa is an entertainment uh, and licensing hub for uh, other countries on the continent? So you see, in in um, Africa, it's, it's it's a very diverse country in terms of culture, in terms of languages, and all that, such that. Uh, the consumption of music is mainly localized. You find that what is consumed in South Africa is completely different from what is consumed in Zimbabwe in terms of, uh, even though we have borders, in terms of uh, the type of music, the type of content that gets watched and all that. There could be uh, some crossover in as far as international content is concerned, but in as far as local content is concerned, 
it's something which is completely, completely different. And I think it's a mistake that a lot of people do make to think that if you have got a solution for South Africa, then you have got a solution for the continent. It doesn't work like that. Each and every country is unique and you need to be able to understand the dynamics in each of the countries for you to be able to really operate in that particular country. So if anybody would like to invest and to get their music consumed in any country that is in Southern Africa or in East Africa or Africa, South, South, uh, South, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, it is important that you actually do study each and every individual country, identify exactly what you want to do, see the opportunities and go to that country. Carrying the opportunities that you have seen and what is possible in South Africa across the continent would be a very big mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah so just, just to add on to the conversation, uh, as you know, we've, we've represented a, a couple of musicians from uh, a couple of Pan-African musicians for uh, for a while. So um, I've realized like uh, in a lot of uh, African countries, the, the systems are not as functional as in South Africa. There are, there are a couple of uh, very impressive uh, countries that are, are coming up. Uh, Zambia, Rwanda, uh, Nigeria, they're coming up. But you'll find that uh, when you interact with the musicians, uh, you find that they struggle to actually get royalties. And then they tend to then come down to South Africa to get representation so that uh, they can hopefully benefit through that stream. Uh, because South Africa is, a, you know, is a bit more organized and uh, uh, the infrastructure of music publishing, uh, of royalty collection is, is a lot more enlightened. So uh, we, as a result, we end up representing a, a lot of music from other African countries, uh, a lot of musicians from other African countries, because then um, most of the uh, uh, basically the, the mechanical transfer that happens in South Africa is more likely to be uh, recorded uh, than in other African countries. Like uh, there they some informal situations in other Africa, African countries where people are, are, are doing cash to cash basis. There's no proper banking system that they follow. Uh, the people will be selling music from basically supermarkets and uh, they'll be selling music from like in, in very informal platforms. So um, a lot of African musicians make music, uh, I mean, money through live performance. Um, but mostly if they want to to seek publishers, they, 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 they then have to come to South Africa because then we are affiliated with the likes of Samro, Capasso, Risa, uh, organizations that are well established. Right. And the biggest benefit is actually in as far as digital exploitation is concerned, because that's where we can then be able to collect directly and then be able to pay them even for usages that would have happened in their own home countries. But in as far as local broadcasts is concerned, uh, there's no way we can then be able to get that. So they just try to see, okay, if I get to South Africa, I get on to the publisher or I join Capas or Samro directly, at least I can be able to get uh, the exploitation from the digital services. But otherwise, obviously, they will have to forget about. Uh, so what we always do is we always advise that for local consumption on local radio and local TV, you need to still be a member of the local society. We can only yeah. assist with digital exploitation. Yeah. So, so I think the easiest way, Ron, any advice I'd give anyone is that, yes, uh, you know, I agree with Jotun. The tastes are different and, you know, for every country. But it, it is much more, I think, efficient, as Simon has said, to start in South Africa purely because it allows you to come into a space where there's a, sort of like a lower, you know, barrier of entry in a sense of, you know, the technology is there. Uh, there's much more understanding in terms of how production music functions. So in that space, you are able to almost sort of like settle and understand how to infiltrate the other spaces. And I think maybe the question is based on the fact that, yes, South Africa has definitely the biggest pot in terms of music royalties, if you look at it from, you know, the other, you know, African countries. So therein is the differences. So 
you are much more, in my view, easy, you know, you are much more sort of guaranteed to receive royalties from your music in South Africa uh, than other countries. But, you know, you can use South Africa as a base to start infiltrating into other territories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the wonderful thing that I see happening for, for Sub-Saharan Africa is that, uh, you know, you get uh, TV stations that are emerging, like the likes of Multi Toys, Honey, that are doing African continent, going into the continent, shooting and doing post-production in South Africa, again, because of how organized South Africa is. So you find that your, your, basic, your basic transfer of the music happens in South Africa. So we're able to help a lot of musicians to collect uh, mechanicals, we, uh, even uh, uh, mechanicals in the territory. So they at least guarantee that they, there will be income for them for content that, that is being produced in their country in that way. You find like uh, a lot of uh, TV stations and production houses will set up shop in South Africa and operate from there and then go into the continent. Uh, there's a lot of countries that are developing and are starting to do their own thing. But uh, the situation is still like that. And uh, musicians often, when they get become big in their countries, they, they will then have to migrate to South Africa and do deals so that they secure uh, the, the royalties. Mm -hmm. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, okay, I have a composer question, a couple of composer questions here. We have three minutes. So this is a performing rights question from George Callis. He says he scored music for Nigerian films with commercial success in cinema and television and other African countries. He owns the publishing. He has not received any royalties from uh, PRS or BMI. So what would be your suggestion for this uh, gentleman to follow up on his royalties from these Nigerian films? So uh, firstly, that, that shows the challenge that we're referring to in terms of, you know, extracting the royalties from, you know, certain territories within Africa. But that's, I think from a solution perspective, because what you would expect firstly is that, uh, you know, uh, Coson would, would then, you know, uh, be able to license, be it the respective cinemas or broadcasters in their territory and then pay the money through to PRS or be it BMI. But then uh, if, the, if the programming also shows in South Africa, for example, uh, that will be picked up and then we'll be able to pay through. And that is provided that uh, the notifications are also available on CISnet uh, in terms of that particular, let's say, movie or series or you know, show so that we are able to pay the money through because we need to know who the music belongs to. But simplistically, I would say log a query with the respective society because you would log a query with your society being PRS or BMI to raise it with, uh, you know, the Nigerian society so that they can then look at the usage for that particular movie and report back so that you can get your royalties. Because within a seminal context, we do the same thing. We do log queries among societies if there are composers that have not been paid for specific usage, and then we do correct that. So uh, the same process should then be undertaken. So from a, a mechanical rights perspective, I think uh, um, if uh, my, 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 what I would say is that if it is on a, a local TV station uh, and local cinemas, then they've got to rely on the local society. But if it happens to be on a multi-territorial one, which is like um, multi-choice, uh, we can be able, as Capasso, we can be able to do that because Nigeria is one of the countries where, which we cover with the blanket license. So it depends on which particular uh, service the music was used. So if it happens to be multi-choice, then we should be able to assist in that perspective. Uh, I, obviously, we won't be able to get back to seven years, but at least going forward and probably covering the previous year, that might be covered uh, within our blanket license if it is on multi-choice. Very good. Well, it looks like we have uh, 15 seconds and counting down, so everything timed out perfectly. I want to thank our panelists again, uh, Carabo, Joe, Tom, and Simon. This has been incredibly informative. I don't know if it's going to cut me off, but Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and thanks to our panelists, and, uh, and hope everyone enjoys the rest of the conference. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Rod. Cheers. Bye-bye.
Bye.